Uh, I, I'm the uh, chair of the committee. Ah, okay, cool. Would you mind uh, switching on your camera? Sorry. <laughs> oh, it's translating it for me, whatever we say. And I guess, uh, it's writing it down. So, auch in Deutsch? Does it? No, 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 it's doing it in English. No, no, that we. <laughs> but still. But when I say something in Deutsch, I say. Touch saga. Okay, that doesn't work. Oh, it's translating it for me, whatever we say. Are you streaming? Sorry, let me close that. Auch in Deutsch? No, 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 it's doing it. <laughs> when, where are we streaming this? Worldwide. <laughs> Everybody's watching. Brazil, probably. <laughs> no, but, but I think it's actually it's a, it's a critical question because we have to disable that when we um, do close up. Yeah, yeah, that's why you should be the host because then you can change that. Yeah, we have to know that it's active. Oh, sorry, so yeah, it's streaming. Okay. To YouTube or what? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a private. It's a private link, so only people that I've sent to have the link. Well, um, I also made myself to the, um, to the person who takes the protocol, um, and then I also um, everybody's here. So Andre Maya Chagas is here, who will enter his thesis today. Welcome. Um, it's unusual to do this online, but I think by now we all have ample practice and Thomas Euler is here, Starenberg. So first, the proceedings are as usual. I think all of us are familiar with them. We will hold you for about 30 minutes. And then we will question you at least 30 minutes. Um, these questions can be on, on topic of the thesis, but also general nature. And then afterwards, there's a closed session um, with only um, the evaluators. That hopefully, will be a positive PhD. All right. So, uh, if you want, just go ahead and start your. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let me share my presentation. Okay, so just a second, please. Um, okay, can everyone see my screen? Okay, so um, hi everyone. Uh, I would like to start by saying thanks for all of the members in the board for taking the time and the effort to read my thesis and correct it, uh, and for being here today to evaluate this work. Um, I'll, as mentioned, I'll be presenting um, the work I've been doing um, over the last few years that culminated in this thesis. Um, I also would like to thank Professor Euler for letting me uh, work in his lab and giving me the opportunity to develop this under his supervision, and the thesis is entitled Open Neuroscience Challenging Scientific Barriers with Open Source Hardware. Um, here's a little bit of what, we, what I plan for the next 30 minutes. We start with a small overview on scientific tools and why they're important for scientific progress. Then I move on to show uh, in detail the four articles that compose the thesis. And in the end, we see the challenges and the outlook that are present for open source hardware to be more widely adopted in academia. Um, I think it goes a little bit without saying, but I'd like to say it anyways, that scientific progress is tightly coupled uh, with the tools we have available to investigate natural phenomena, right? Because they allow researchers to see, record, and analyze events that are invisible to the naked eye. In neurosciences, for instance, uh, we're only able to understand how action potentials properly propagate in neurons when Hodgkin and Huxley perfected the available recording system around that was available around the 1940s to improve the voltage clamp technique. This improvement and a lot of hard work led them to publish a series of papers that 
uh, eventually led them to the Nobel Prize um, and led us to the better understanding on how ions move across a membrane to elicit action potential, right? What we can see here in this image, we fast forward technology and the tools that we use a little bit. And what we can see here in this image is a fluorescence microscope, right? Although the technology for this microscope is not new since the compound microscope is from the late 17th century, uh, it's still quite expensive to buy one of these. So they cost around 10,000 pounds. And this, is, this in itself is already an issue as it prevents a lot of labs and institutions from accessing the appropriate tools to develop their research programs, right? Another issue with these two and the current way they're distributed is that most companies that develop laboratory equipment are based on uh, Europe, the US, Japan, and China mostly, or the global North. And they are developed with these consumer markets in, in mind. So basically, for instance, this one, as you can see, is a quite bulky microscope. It's meant to be stationary. It needs to be connected to mains power all the time to work. And it doesn't do well with high temperatures and humidity. So even when people that are not part of this, um, this targeted market buy this, let's say in the global south, let's say in Brazil where I'm from, these tools are operating under suboptimal conditions, right? So another issue with the high cost is that people will not likely open this up to see how they work and they will not basically customize them for experiments because most labs will have only one of them. And if they break, it's a big headache and a lot of time, downtime without doing experiments, right? All of this hurts science in the long run as we have less people being equipped to perform cutting edge experiments and to contribute to the scientific advancement. We also need to remember that scientific improvement is not necessary only by the sake of knowledge itself, but because science is the main driver of development and prosperity across the globe. So more people doing science, the more chances we have for better prosperity and development in, in many countries around the world. Uh, so as I mentioned, this is a high cost equipment, although the technology is not super new. There are only a few distributors. It's a proprietary tool, so it's a black box. We cannot know how it works because we cannot open to study it. There are very fragile supply chains. And because of the way they are developed and people are not able to tinker with them, there is low change and slow innovation cycles with these tools. The solution for this would be to take open source philosophy, which is already available in software, um, to create and distribute research equipment where all the blueprints are made freely available. So anyone can change, copy, improve, modify and even sell existing designs. This is, as I mentioned, is already established in software, but this new method of distributing hardware is gaining power for a number of years now. And this brings us to the main points that were made in the first papers that composed the thesis. Uh, this paper, the Open Labware 3D Printing Your Own Lab Equipment, um, proposes the idea that by using 3D printing technology, that was quite, that was finally affordable in 2015 when we published the paper, off the shelf components, a lot of online tutorials and open source philosophy. It would be easier than ever for researchers to build and use uh, custom and appropriate tools for their research. In the paper, we, we specified or we gave some um, attention to the fact that this would be great opportunities for education because a lot of the costs of making educational tools will be brought down and would allow a lot of hands-on teaching experiences to educate and train the next generation of researchers. Um, in our hand, we not only wrote about this, but together in collaboration with Trend in Africa, we did several workshops showing researchers how to use all of this to actually build their own tools. And what you're seeing here are two participants in one of the workshops that we did in 2014, soldering bioamplifiers that they would later use to do experiments where they would record neuroactivity in crickets, um, in, the, in the legs of crickets. We did surveys uh, back in 2014 before this paper, and this is data that it's on the paper, was published showing that people did have some literacy on using computers and software packages, 
but they were not yet equipped to use um, uh, analysis tools and programming tools that would allow them to use 3D printers and off-the-shelf components. So we did organize, uh, and I participated and organized, as faculty has organized, on more than 13 uh, workshops since then on four different continents. And on these workshops, we leverage open source projects and 3D printers and simple electronics to show participants how to build their own equipment. In 2017, uh, we did one workshop. One of the models of the workshop we did was a two week hands-on workshop where participants would start with no, or, no prior or very little knowledge about 3D printing and electronics. By the end, they were exposed enough so that they would start building their own tools. And also they would leave the workshop with um, a complete build 3D printer that they built themselves and electronic components. What I wanna show here in the video is the first time one of these devices is being turned on uh, by, the particip by one group of participants and their tutor. And this is a centrifuge that they downloaded uh, from, from as an open source model on the internet. And so basically with this, I'm trying to show that using leveraging open source technologies and available tutorials online. Um, and here we're just showing that this actually separates the phases of MUC. Um, we can get from zero knowledge into be able to reproduce tools in as little time as intensive as two weeks with intensive work. Uh, in 2018, one year after this workshop, we did another one where participants actually managed to build their own automated open source activity measurement box for rodents and get it published on a peer reviewed journal. And this is what is depicted here. So basically, um, we are, I'm just trying to make the point that what we predicted in the paper, kind of, we worked a lot on it to make it come into reality that we can actually train people to build their own tools locally. This case is a group from Ghana that now has local technology that they can use to advance their research by building their own tools without depending on these supply chains from vendors in Europe, the US or uh, China. So following our own advice, we actually also developed our own open source tools. And the first example that I'm gonna show you is the 100 Euro Lab, which is a 3D printed uh, open source platform that is able to perform a lot of um, state-of-the-art methods in neurosciences. Done in collaboration with Lucia, Tom, and Ari uh, back in Tübingen in 2017, we show that you 3D printed parts and some simple electronics in this very first version of the electronic parts that I designed. Um, we can actually do this state-of-the-art uh, experiments. So we show that this tool works for uh, optical microscopy, basically ranging from the macro level down to tens of microns. And what we can see here in I is eggs of schistosoma present in human urine. So basically this is a human parasite. So this could be used um, to detect parasites that you can get from drinking uh, contaminated water. Um, this oni is basically a pyramidal neuron from a fresh cut um, of a brain slice in mouse. And at the bottom here, what you can see hopefully is um, the beating heart of a zebrafish larvae and its vascular system working with the, with the blood flow. Um, yeah. We also showed that we can do fluorescence imaging with this tool, basically showing that uh, here on the left, what we can see is um, calcium signaling in the neuromuscular junction of the, the larva of Drosophila. As you can see here on the edges, these bright white spots and the beating heart of a zebrafish expressing green fluorescent protein. We also went on to show um, that we can do optogenetics with these two. And what you can see in the top row are two different model organisms that, were, that are expressing channel rhodopsin. 
So it's basically a protein that opens up uh, um, ion, a pore in the membrane of new, or in this case, in neurons, uh, eliciting neuronal activity when we shine blue light uh, on the samples. So here you can see the zebrafish larvae again and the movement of the fins whenever blue light is shined on it. And here you can see the muscles of um, Drosophila larva contracting when we have light shine, no, shine being shown on them. At the bottom, what you can see is a different uh, optogenetic tool. It's basically, it's crimson, which is a red shifted tool. So basically instead of responding to blue LEDs, this one responds to red LEDs. And what we get is an extension of the proboscides of the, of the Drosophila whenever we shine red light um, on, this, on this sample. We then uh, obviously went for a precise characterization on how these things are working. And so basically what you can see in A and B is how the fluorescence mode works with um, the LED light coming at a 45 degree angle being filtered by an excitation filter, then being shown on the sample. The sample then elicits, emits green light. Um, then we have an emission filter that makes sure that only the green light is passing through the filter and is detected by the camera. This is what we can see, or basically the spectra of the filters can be seen in D together with the excitation of GFP and the emission uh, spectra of GFP. So we can see that the excitation filter and the emission filter nicely help to separate excitation and emission light. Uh, interestingly, these filters are from theater lighting and they're surprisingly cheap and well characterized in terms of the spectra and how much light they let through um, according to the wavelength of light. We also characterize the sensitivity or we actually in this case um, for this specific camera leverage on somebody else's work to characterize uh, the sensitivity of the red, green, sorry, the red, green, and blue channels of the, of the camera. And this we use to show users that if they want to do fluorescence, they need to nicely match the emission of their probe together with the sensitivity of the camera so that the camera is actually able to pick up um, the signals coming from the sample. Here on the right side on E, we show, we use quantum dots to actually uh, determine the point spread function of the camera and the fluorescent system. And we show this to be in the order of tens of microns, um, as you can see here in F. In the bottom row, what we see is that uh, this is the zebrafish, is a zebrafish larvae, which is expressing GFP on its neurons, on its neuronal tissue. And this is just a normal optical microscopy mode. Then we switch on um, fluorescence mode. And you can see here a little bit of crosstalk with uh, the yolk, which contains autofluorescence. And in I, what we can see is how this system can be used, for instance, to select in between zebrafish larvae that are not expressing GFP and the ones that are here uh, in the bottom. We then do the same for the optogenetic, tool, optogenetic tools, where we show that using an RGB LED ring with powerful LEDs, we can then have a sample between the LED and the camera. Um, and we characterize the, the spectral distribution and the power of each of these LEDs in this ring. And we show that we can again use a affordable filter to filter out only or to only allow the red LED to pass through. And this would be used when we are actually activating the crimson um, sample that I showed with the proboscides of the, of the drosophila. Here at the bottom, what we can see is actually Again, the, the zebrafish larvae that is expressing channel rhodopsin uh, in its neurons and how shining light, which is depicted shining blue light, which is depicted here with the blue shaded areas elicits movements from the fins and how we can actually control how much movement is being done by controlling how um, wide or how long these pulses are. So we can see here for long pulses, we get actually let's call a, re a um, refraction period of movement of the fins. But if you do have a smaller excitation window, then we get a more precise 
movement of the fins of the animals. Um, as I mentioned, this, this system actually evolved quite a bit and I was responsible in this paper for also designing uh, the electronics on this. I guess the point that I'm trying to make here is that, again, people with little prior training to electronics can actually learn these things as they are developing with available online tutorials and tools and leveraging open source um, licenses and systems. And what we can see here is the final PCB or the mature version of the PCB of the FlyPy, where we have different modules that are compartmentalized for each of these different actuators and sensors that I showed. So basically you have two voltage converters that control, that supply the correct voltage for the devices. Then you have high power LED units, an RGB ring controller, a module for a servo motor that does automatic focusing and a Peltier module composed of a temperature sensor, a fan and a Peltier that is able then to nicely control temperature in let's say thermogenetic experiments. We fi or finally, I also show here that we design and I wrote a graphical user interface so that users can have easy access to all of these or they can, to all of the functions of these actuators and sensors um, so that they can try and probe things around. But we also wrote a protocol system where they can automate experiments down to millisecond precision and record data automatically in an organized way. Uh, again, to show that these tools are being picked up and used and trying to make the point that open source tools make for much faster adoption worldwide. Uh, we see here that there are more than 50 fly pies that have been deployed in museums, high schools and universities. Some of these were done with our help in workshops, but some of these were actually done uh, independently. And hopefully this is not the actual number, hopefully there are more of people who simply built them and simply didn't uh, send us a notice or let us know that they actually built one. Another point that I would like to make is that open source tools allow for researchers to leverage each other's efforts. So what you're seeing here on the right side is PySpy, which is a derivative of the FlyPy that was developed by a group in the US at Bucknell University, where they adapted the system for experiments with ants. And here you can see a single unit of this device, sorry. And on the right side, you can see several of them running in parallel, um, which makes data collection much faster, allows them to run different types of experiments and different types of questions. Okay, so this is very nice. And then I'm showing that we also used open source technologies to replicate existing tools, right? But can we actually um, build tools that are not available or that are able to perform functions that are not available? And so in 2019, we published a paper, which is a collaboration in between uh, Tom Baden's lab and Thomas Euler's lab, um, where we showed that we can, um, or we showed how to build and design a spatial visual stimulator that can basically take any type of commercially available LED. And we can combine six types of LEDs with the stimulators um, and sync them with electrophysiology and to photon systems, making it a quite powerful system to stimulate different animal models in a precise and organized way. Uh, in the paper, we show both mouse and zebrafish stimulators, but for the sake of time, I'm only going to talk about one type of the stimulators that we use for mice experiments. Just a very brief uh, overview, why we need to do this. So basically what you can see here in A, are the spectral distributions of the cones or the spectral sensitivities of the cones present in the mouse retina together with the rod as the black line, as the rod sensitivity in the black line. Um, and what you can see is that these are, red uh, are left shifted in comparison to the human retina, right? First thing that you notice is that they only have two cones instead of three. And here on the right, we can actually see that the retina, the cone distribution in the retina is quite different with more M or more mid um, wavelength cones being present on the dorsal retina as compared to the ventral and more short wavelength cones, sensitive cones present in the ventral retina as compared to the dorsal retina. 
in mice, different from humans, there, are, there is no uh, fovea. Um, here, just for clarity's sake, why we also did this for zebrafish. Zebrafish actually have four different cone types. Um, and the distribution is also quite different from what you would think, at least in the adult zebrafish from human retina, right? So they're very evenly distributed all across the retina. Um, so why is this a big issue? If we do use a TFT monitor or a projector that was designed for humans, we can see here on B on the right side that these stimulators, even the shortest wavelength that they use is not able to stimulate the shortest or the cone that responds to the shortest wavelength of light in mice. So basically whenever researchers are using commercially available tools that are designed for humans, they are doing an incomplete stimulation of the mouse visual system, which can lead to a lot of problems in the responses they get, the cut of results and how to interpret them. Here, uh, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more in detail later, but basically we show, I show here that in the paper and in this work, we chose LEDs that are able to actually uh, stimulate both the S and the M cones of mice um, in a very precise and separated pattern, pattern. So, I mean, if you think about it, LEDs are very cheap and projectors are also very cheap and you could just buy, buy both from China, put them together and be done, right? And why, and why so is this a big deal of what we're doing? And again, as always, the devil is in the details, right? Because what we're doing is that we're trying to stimulate the mouse visual system while doing recordings with a two photo microscope. And this adds a lot of complexity to the system basically because in the two photo system, what you have is an excitation laser that is basically exciting your sample. The sample itself is then giving out a fluorescent signal that is coming back through the objective of the microscope and being deflected into a very sensitive detector. This detector is so sensitive that we need to make sure that whenever we have our LEDs on, we're not saturating the detector or even damaging it by the amount of light of, um, that is given out by our stimulator. And the way we do that is that um, we are basically, let me first, before I, I, I tell you how I do that, let me actually show how the system couples um, with the two photo microscopes. So what we have here from the very right is the green LED and the UV LED that we use for the mouse system with the respective uh, filters and light and lenses to collimate the light so that it's basically um, being captured by a collimator and sent through a light guide into a wave, into a broad wave, a broad spectrum stimulator um, that then is able to spatially project images and movies um, into our perfusion chamber with the retina, right? This objective here is equivalent to this one. So as you can see, all the light in this case that is coming from my stimulator is basically going straight up into the direction of my uh, detectors. So as I mentioned, we can basically preserve our detectors and make sure that we're not thinking we are detecting fluorescence while we're actually detecting the LED light from the stimulator by only turning on our LEDs when the laser um, that is exciting our sample is off. So basically these systems, they work with the lasers only being on at 80% of the time. And in this moment here, what is actually happening is that the scanning mirrors of this system is going back to its home position to start a new scanning frame. And in this moment, we're actually able to then use our LEDs from the stimulator to stimulate our, or to show visual stimulus to our sample. And this in a way, uh, make sure that whatever we grab in the detectors in this period can be disregarded as noise, but at the same time makes the problem that we're only stimulating the sample at 20% of the time. So we have to be even more careful with the LEDs that we choose. Another way to make sure we're not damaging the detectors and not detecting false signals is to basically use the filters that I mentioned to spectrically separate the LEDs from the fluorescence channel. So basically on top, what you can see is the spectra of the LED, UV and green. 
And here, what you can see in the bottom is the fluorescence channels that are in the detectors, their spectra. So basically what I'm showing is that even the green LED is now here in the middle and is not being detected by the PMT detectors because we are filtering this out with a custom dichroic mirror here in the middle. Um, from the electronic side, um, I won't go too much into details because of time, but basically I designed uh, three electronic boards for these different systems and only two of them I'm gonna show here. So basically board one takes the signal that is used to synchronize the system with the two photo microscope, combines it with the signals, the control signals from the stimulator and sends it to an LED driver uh, that then controls each specific or each one of board, each one of the boards that are board of this type of board two can be used for one LED and so drive one different type of LED. And so with these two boards, we create a very generic solution where people can use any type of LED and just feed the control signal from the two photon and the stimulator to this LED driver and control these LEDs and then feedback the LED, the LED lighting to the stimulator system. Um, here is just to show the controls that we did in the paper. So basically again, showing how the spectrum of the LEDs is actually um, stimulating cones, the cones of the mouse. And here on D on the right side, we showed that getting more power from the LEDs doesn't change the spectral distribution. So they're quite precise spectrally. And going down here to the bottom left, what we can see is that increasing the brightness of the LEDs doesn't linearly increases the isomerization rate, as you can see from the bottom line here, which is the raw data in green and a sigmoid fit, sigmoidal fit uh, in black. So what we do is you create a lookup table um, to correct for this. And then we have a linear increase in the isomerization rates of the cones given the increase of brightness. Okay. Would you slowly come to an end? Yeah. Uh, we later show, sorry, I'm gonna do, just do this quickly. Um, as you can see here on A, if the UV LED um, act, actually activates a tail, the tail of the M cone. So we show here that both LEDs independently stimulate each cone with the UV LED stimulating a little bit of the green cone as it happens in nature. Uh, we then show data for this, uh, where we're using uh, calcium indicator um, that is only expressed in cones. And we use sinusoidal waves of a spot and calculate a spectral contrast to show that on the dorsal retina, we have more activation of um, the cones using the green LED as compared to the ventral retina where we have more activation of the cones using the UV LED. Um, I would like to get more into the details of this, but to the sake of time, um, the last paper that composes this thesis is actually a revisit of uh, the paper we published in 2015. This is an opinion piece that I published in 2018 in PLUS that shows how the whole field evolved over these three years and how uh, open source hardware should not only be used in places where there is a money constraint, but everywhere, right? Because they allowed for more specific tools for experiments, faster innovation cycles, lower costs, and because of the lower cost, increased accessibility, more opportunity for hands-on education and more parallelization of experiments. Um, briefly, the challenges for open source hardware in academia is that nowadays there is no standardization tools for archiving, archiving and documenting uh, open science hardware. So there are different degrees of documentation available out there. The skills needed, needed to build tools are not given as a course curricula for training scientists. The time spent to furnish labs with building tools is quite high because labs use a lot of tools. So if you have to build all of them, you would spend a lot of time. Uh, another challenge would be to get a buy-in from traditional companies um, so that they would be start to be providers of open source hardware. But for that, they would need to stop leveraging um, patents and, and intellectual property and actually become service providers. 
And there are also challenges with certifications such as CE certification and medical certification. As an outlook, uh, I think we're living in the Cambrian explosion of open source hardware with more than hundreds of projects being uh, published and, and available online. Uh, this is something that I showed, sorry, that I showed in the thesis that out of an end of 251 papers that are depicting open science hardware, there is an increase in number over time. And what you can see here in black is just events that I thought that are uh, very important for the field, such as the, the creation of new um, journals dedicated to open science hardware and meetings that are putting together uh, networks of people that are actually building um, open science hardware. And in light blue, you can see the papers that compose the thesis. Uh, this is something that we're writing about currently and should be hopefully out soon. Um, and with that, I would like to say thank you for your time. I would like to thank again, um, Thomas and people in his lab for all the great work, the graduate school, uh, the scene for all the support over the years, uh, Tom and his lab in Sussex, Sussex Neuroscience, all people in trend and all my collaborators in open neuroscience. Um, now I open for your questions and leave my contact details in case um, you have any questions or follow-ups that you would like to do later. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Andrew, uh, for this fascinating talk and uh, look into all the different projects in um, open science that you that you did. Um, who would like to start the questioning round? Okay, Jan. So, yeah, thank you for this nice presentation. And it's fascinating to see what's going on in this open science community. Uh, you mentioned that problem in the very beginning that in, in the more southern countries, uh, the, the, the environmental conditions are much different. Can you, do you have some more specific experience what can go wrong in these yeah. uh, environments? Sure. So, for instance, uh, in one of the many workshops that we did that we revisited um, some of the alumni that we had from previous workshop, uh, we, we saw that the 3D printer that they had, so we did one workshop in 2015, and in 2017, we revisited those uh, participants from that workshop. And the printer that they had built had a lot of rust, and the wood parts that were used to build that specific print had absorbed a lot of humidity. Yeah. So while this was a very nice project that was done, we, we took the blueprints from a project done in Michigan in the US, it didn't cope well in Africa where humidity and the temperature is yeah, much rest. higher. Yeah. So how, how much does this influence uh, electronic parts? So if you design your PCB board here, will it also work? as well, right? So but, that's an issue that I think there is no way around it, except that you need to design enclosures for your electronics that are right. then uh, hermetically closed and are more controlled environmentally, um, so to say, as compared to something that will be yeah, yeah. left and exposed in time. Right. Are, are there some approaches to that or <laughs> uh, <laughs> that you're aware of? Or? As I mentioned, right, so um, I don't know of any, let's say, commercial or any big projects that tackle this. But for instance, closing your electronics in an hermetically sealed box with silica yeah. or things like that. And then of course you have the yeah, trouble yeah. exchanging this over time right, right, right. would be a good solution for this, I think. Yeah, okay, yeah, I know it. <laughs> yeah. Next question. Yeah, maybe. Oh, um, yeah, a nice presentation. How does the resolution from your 3D printed microscope that you presented in the um, beginning part, how does that um, compare to the resolution of purchased microscopes and what are the limits of the resolution in your setup versus um, in commercially available setups? Right, so in this specific microscope, we're not able to do everything that you would do with a traditional microscope. Our, so we, we showed this on the, sorry, let me just show this here. Um, yeah. 
So you can see here, this is a figure from the paper. You can see here in K, uh, what I'm showing here is a magnification of J, where you can see red blood cells, which are the blue transparent-ish ones. And as you can see, the resolution there is not enough to let's say detect malaria, right? As you would with a regular microscope. Um, because the optical, I, we think that the issue is with the optical system. So basically here we're using a conventional uh, plastic lens system, and it's not a it's not related to the sensor of the camera, and we know this because there is another open source project called Open Flexure, where they actually exchange this this lens system by an actual microscope objective, and they're actually able to detect malaria parasites inside red blood cells. Right, and um, nicely enough, they're actually doing this with let's say more affordable objective, uh, microscope objective that they buy from China. Um, so even these, let's say lower grade optics are able to do these very fine resolutions um, coupled with a tube lens they have in their system and so on. Yeah, in uh, this publication, you quantified the resolution yourself, like the point spread function. So like it's, it's known then uh, for the people who want to use it, maybe uh, like how good it will perform in that respect. But um, other people who have like hardware initiatives, they might not do that, or there might be other parameters that uh, you did not test in, the pa in your paper, but that are like important uh, to other people's work, uh, which creates a problem with regards to the uh, reliability and the, and the benchmarking of the, um, of the open source hardware devices, um, which uh, can be like a yeah, limitation to the spread of these, um, of, of, of these tools. So I'm wondering uh, what you think, what would be the best way to do this as a community to, um, get our quickest path forward for reliable, reusable results using open source hardware. Right, I think that um, the best, I think the, the trick with open hard, of, with open source technologies is always documentation, right? So here in our paper, we do characterize the point spread function as you mentioned, but as I mentioned, there is no standardization for the documentation of open source hardware. So even these two journals that I mentioned, they're not talking to each other and saying, look, this is the field, we're only the two, we're the only two journals, let's come up with a system where we tell authors that they need to provide, you know, these calibration protocols and these standards and so on. And because this is not available, then as you mentioned, different projects have different levels of characterization, right? Um, and so I think a solution for this would be for these people to come together and say, look, we are still a quite small community. Let's make a standard and let's make sure that everything that comes out from now on follows these principles and these standards so that people know exactly what the hardware is doing, what is the limitation and how they can actually calibrate and test it and what they need to watch out for. Does that answer your question? Yeah, um, it it does in a way. I mean, I, I still think it, it, it's it's a probably something that is difficult for <clears throat> uh, a lab to do. Like that, just wants to get something to work for for their lab, maybe in the first place. So just they're happy if it works for them. But then to standardize it is like something that creates a lot of overhead of of work. So I was wondering about right. your your take on this. Right. I mean, that's correct. Yeah. I mean, a way of seeing if things are working properly is to benchmark against existing tools. Right. So for instance, we could take this side by side with a regular fluorescence microscope and see how far we can push both. And okay, I know that with, my, with the FlyPi, I can only go down so much, or I can only do these types of fluorescence while with the already available microscope, I can do all of these experiments. And then you know, because you can compare results, right? If you do the same experiment on both platforms, you should get hopefully the same <laughs> results. And therefore, you should be able to benchmark them and say, okay, this is where I need to stop with this one. And this is where I need to take it further. Okay, thanks. Maybe Thomas first. Yeah. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, my question goes a little bit in this direction. So you're, you're often comparing this to open software. Yeah, and there are, I mean, we, we all know if you use open software, you first have to check whether the package has been developed in the last year or whether it's just abandoned. 
and in, in the software, I think there is, um, there is a way of, um, I mean, and some packages are getting, um, get playing a certain role and are supported by, by a large community, like let's say um, NumPy or, or Ubuntu or something like this. Is there anything like this already visible in, in open hardware? Because I mentioned that, I mean, it's, it's a bit more difficult. You need equipment, yeah? yeah. You cannot just uh, have a bunch of people sitting there with computers. Yeah. What's your... So hardware, I would say that this is kind of, there are examples, but they're still niche to certain sub areas of knowledge, right? So for instance, if you take um, OpenTrons, which is an automatic pipetting robot, Right, this started as a master thesis in NYU. And now it's actually a company um, that has been picking up a lot of momentum and gathering a lot of users because with about $2,000, you can have a complete automated system for pipetting and doing molecular biology protocols in the lab. So I would expect that if they do their, their, their job properly in the next few years, this will be the next thing for uh, molecular biology automation in the labs. But is this uh, still open? It's still open. Uh, and interestingly enough, and hopefully it will remain open, but interestingly enough, this also captured uh, venture or money from venture capitalists, from venture capital, right? Which um, indicates that people can see that open source hardware can be profitable. I mean, I'm not discussing the, the, the philosophy behind venture capital or anything, but it shows that there is a possibility for the whole field to shift for open source software from mainly the capitalistic point of view, right? Uh, but back to your question, for instance, if we take, let's say OpenFlexure, OpenFlexure is also taking a lot of new users, especially because there is a dedicated team that is properly funded, uh, and these people, are, these people know, this is uh, Richard Bowman's group in here in the Bath University here in the UK. Um, and they're properly funded and they have a dedicated team working on improving and developing and providing support for people who want to, to build their tools, right? So as with software, the best tools will become more widely used if there is a developing team nurturing this yeah. tool. Right? Okay. Well, I also have a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe stepping a, a bit back. So from the various projects that you've done where you've created blueprints, do you notice any any emergent theme or, um, any, or best any emerging theme or best practice solution how to best tackle creating like a new blueprint for a new device? Yeah, so there are um, so there are two things happening right now that are quite exciting. So a group in Germany, I mean, now they're spread, but it started by open source ecology in Germany. They actually worked with the DIN Institute. Um, Institute. So they, they created a DIN specification for uh, open source hardware documentation, both for building and um, using, I think. This is quite technical and quite on a high level. So it's probably not going to reach all of the open source hardware projects, um, but it's a start for making this reach the industry. Um, another exciting thing. But, but I think my question was on a much more practical level. Mm -hmm. now imagine I'm sitting in a lab somewhere in Africa and I'm using your open source pipettes and your lab tool. And, and then I want to create a new design. Right. How do I go about that? Right. So because initially you would have to use the same tools that I use for my design because simply because you would like to modify my files, right? You wouldn't mm -hmm. want to necessarily start from scratch. But let's say in the case of the electronics of the FlyPy, right? I want to add a new module. So I'm going to open up um, the file that describes the PCB, the printed circuit board, and make um, a new module for it in that file, right? Um, and so by doing that, and to do that, I would need to then use the same software package that I, the original developer, used for it. 
I think it's still not the question that I want to ask um, that you're answering. Um, okay. So I think what I would like to know is, so I, I, I remember Tom fiddling around with putting a bit more plastic here and there yeah. to make it stable, for example, right? Or to make it accurate. Um, like when you have, when you build like a pipetting device, you want to make it accurate. So you need to, and it's, at least these first designs were a lot of trial and error. And do you have any experiences to share that, that are like, let's say principles or, or structural principles like that you have to, that you have to adhere to, to make things work, like things that work well with 3D printing, others that don't, like maybe it's right. hard to move in or I don't know. Yeah, so again, right, it, it goes back to documentation. So the, a lot of trial and error um, happens because maybe somebody, or let's say I'm the original developer of something, right? I'm doing all of this trial and error procedure and I'm learning as I go what works or not for a 3D printed pipette. If I document all of this and I say, look, when I change this parameter, this happened and the precision went up twofold. Right. Whenever somebody else is working on an implementation of a new design based on my design, they, if they have my notes, which should be published with the open source design, they should be able to leverage from that. Right. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I'm saying this in this way because also the technology for the tools that we use to make tools is developing quite quickly. So a 3D printer from five years ago it's very, very bad as compared to a 3D printer that I can buy today using the same basic technology, right? So um, you get more from documenting what happened and how this thing evolved than actually saying this printer needs to be done in this in this way and so on, because most likely users will use a different printer and will have different types of filaments and so on. I don't know if this now answers <laughs> your question. Thanks. Who should take the responsibility for the safety of the hardware device? When you mentioned like certifications and we saw this uh, video that you showed with like a spinning, uh, fast uh, spinning uh, Eppendorf or centrifuge. And if it like breaks and hits somebody, then uh, of course the, the person maybe who developed it will say, well, I just tried to help. But um, like, uh, what is the best way of like, should that be like outsourced to like a third party or, or is it, would it be like with a, with a lab whoever like creates it? Because I could also see that universities might have a problem if too many uh, handmade uh, devices uh, fly around in the labs. Right, absolutely. So you're completely correct um, in the sense that all of these devices, if they're not properly tested and certified, they are the best prototypes, right? And a lot of the things we do in, in research and in the university only uses prototypes, right? So in the case of the centrifuge, centrifuges are kind of the things that everybody wants to make because you can see results right away and it spins fast and it's exciting, but they're also the most dangerous, one of the most dangerous things you can build because things flying around at very high speeds have a lot of momentum, right? and they can damage a lot of people. And this is why I think the best solution for this will be when companies actually start leveraging open source prototypes in the sense that they say, okay, Andrea has produced this new exciting tool. We're gonna take our company's know-how to actually bring this, the last stage of development, meaning we're gonna make it safe, we're gonna certify it, and we're gonna put it on the market. And the advantage for this company to do that is that let's say a CE certification is only available if the device is sold by the company that got it certified, right? So let's say I'm company open hardware X and I certify the FlyPi. I'm the only allowed company to sell CE certified FlyPies in the market uh, because I was the one responsible for the certification. Another company can go through the same procedure and certified it as well, but they're not allowed to sell it, sell it as a certified thing if they don't do it themselves. And so what makes me a little bit hopeful is that, um, sorry, just a second. There are many companies coming into this space recently that are selling and designing um, open source hardware. 
and they understood that they can actually leverage from service provision instead of intellectual property. Um, and sorry, let me just find this line that I have with this here. And the number is growing, right? And this is nice because then again, developers inside universities and companies can leverage each other's strengths instead of leaving all the, all the work on one side. So here are just some examples of companies that are selling open source hardware. Super exciting for um, neurosciences, I think are open IFIs that are selling these really complex uh, electrophysiology systems uh, that are hundreds of channels, one or, one or two orders of magnitude cheaper than other commercially available systems. They're investing a lot on development inside the university and open BCI that promotes brain computer interfaces, right? We have many other examples as you can see here. Um, but yeah, I think hopefully in the future, we're gonna see more and more companies providing open source hardware as a service where they do actually certify and make sure that these are safe to use uh, as compared to the very initial prototyping stages. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah. I will unmute you. So, uh, no, I got it. <laughs> um, I wonder what are the limits? You mentioned the open e thing, and also I think your microscope. So, the basic piece providing for functionality in case of your Microsoft is the lens. And this is what you buy. This is, in that sense, not open source hardware. Mm -hmm. And in the open e the basic piece of equipment that relies on is the internal chip which provides all the digitization, amplification, everything. And then you buy things, build things around it, which is nice. So maybe on the example of your microscope, yeah? So what is it, what you make cheap and simple by your open source development? I think it's all the housing and whatever. And, and what do you lose by that? Or do you gain something by it? And, and how much do you rely on, on the core mechanisms that you buy from somewhere else? Right, so, I mean, as you mentioned, right, Open IFIS has these intern chips in it and uh, chip development and integrated circuits development is still very much a closed proprietary yeah. market, right? There are a couple of examples that are now starting to build open source hardware that are chips and integrated circuits, uh, but I don't think we're gonna see them around anytime soon uh, in a wide use case. In our case, um, what is open source is how we put things together, right? So even the Raspberry Pi computer, which is the, the centralizing piece of the FlyPi, uh, it's not on itself open source. But because I specifically state, look, I'm using this model, costs this much, people can see, learn and say, okay, I don't care about this one, I'm gonna use something else, right? So by describing everything, and even if the tools, the pieces themselves are proprietary, we gain by transparency of showing people how these things are put together. And so, as I mentioned, the FlyPi uses this very common M12 threaded objective lens, right? But because we described this and we know of, let's say, open flexure that has this alternative solution with an actual ob microscope objective, users have a choice. And so, even if you're using proprietary tools that are put together to make an open meta, open source design, uh, users gain by uh, being able to study and modify things. As I mentioned, um, for 3D printers, a lot has happened from 2015 to today. And the same is true for cameras, optical systems, and other things. So now, recently, um, the, there was a paper showing that you can now do this deep lab cut animal tracking with a, with a small Intel chip. And you can do real time movement tracking after you've trained your neural networks. In a big computer, you can do the actual real time tracking afterwards uh, in sub millisecond latency using one of these cheap battery powered Intel chips. 
which has a lot of potential applications for field work, right? So basically by having the nice description of how things are put together, people over time can iterate over them and say, okay, this is obsolete technology. Let's implement something else and leverage from that. What, what has changed in terms of printer technology in the last years? Um, and what do you think would be the, the biggest desirables? Like what materials would you be able to? would you like to be able to print? So what has changed since 2015 basically was the, a lot, I mean, more uh, interestingly is the nozzle technology that is now able to do higher temperatures, right? Because a lot of the previously printed components that went into a nozzle of the printer are now all metal and machined and properly like and made in a way that can take temperatures up to 250, 400 degrees. <clears throat> sorry, which opens a lot of possibilities for new materials and also a lot of software development actually. So printers are now able to detect the power cut and stop and save where they stopped and then continue from where they left off uh, when power is re restored. Uh, they can detect the, the printing bed quite nicely so it's pretty easy to level the system. So they're becoming easier and easier to use and all of this additional, additional functionality allows you to go down, let's say, in layering precision. So now you can do, let's say, 50 micron layers with these very cheap $500 printers, which also opens the possibilities for more precise and, and you know, parts with smaller holes and joints and so on. But also uh, these other types of printer, resin printers, that use UV light from an LED or in a laser to cure a resin, they're becoming cheaper and cheaper. And these printers, for instance, they're used for by uh, people who make jewelry so that they can make these very fine details. And there are applications where people show you can actually print lenses with these printers. So you could actually have custom printed lenses. I mean, this is not close to a very good application stage, I think yet. But over time, with the development of better resins and better printers, you should be able to printer, print these non, let's say, traditional lenses that would have a lot of applications in, let's say, neurosciences when you can implant a lens that is very tiny and very specific in the cortex and shine light in different ways inside the brain, for instance. Okay, thank you. Maybe last question, if nobody else has urgent things. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask for the for the for the impact. So you're you're arguing that with these um, open hardware technologies, you can bring research into also southern south world countries, and you enable education there. So are there measurable measurable um, as a measurable impact? Are, are, is there a teaching that you initiated that is now running by itself or is there a scientific output that that you can already see so it's still very early days i think unfortunately i don't have a more measurable outcome uh, i have two things that i can share that are measurable outcomes so basically the same group that developed and published this peer-reviewed paper with their own tool mm -hmm. went on to gain um a grant and do their own workshop in Ghana. So ah. they basically learned from our workshop and did their own workshop mm -hmm. uh, in Ghana, I think in 2019, right? Which was a very welcome uh, piece of news. And the other thing that I can share is that for instance, we are now also doing um, online um, training platforms for the development of open hardware. So basically the idea is to pair open hardware projects with mentors and specialists. And over the course of time, uh, these projects will learn best practices and how to properly document things and so on. And we ran a pilot last year where uh, one of the projects was the UC2 project and from their um, testimonial to us, they say that they learned quite a bit in terms of documentation and how to properly structure the project, right? Uh, and this project, 
if I may share this quickly, um, is actually a teaching system for uh, microscopy. So they show um, a lot of tutorials and how you can um, construct my microscopy system and how Fourier transform of optics work, how light sheet microscopy with optics work. And all of these are 3D printed cubes that attach with magnets and clever uses of lenses and cheap uh, um, laser pointers. Mm, that looks pretty cool, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so any other urgent questions? Then this is the point where I would traditionally ask the audience to step out. So here I will... Uh,